Um, man, so just got to say, each and every one of you are beautiful, and you are being made more beautiful each and every day. And uh, that's my sermon. We're done. Okay. <laughs> just kidding. I totally kidding. But uh, man, that song has uh, been a powerful song in my life. Just as uh, and you know, very shortly you're going to be hearing part of my story, and I'm sure that you will see how uh, how some of that connects. Um, as many of you know, my name is Austin Swain. I'm the youth director here at uh, Cottage Grove United Church of Christ. Um, and as Pastor Brian mentioned, I have a herd of my family that are sitting here in the front. So uh, if you're wondering why there's a whole bunch of new people you've never seen before, it's because you haven't seen them before. They are new. Um, so uh, I'm very excited, to, very excited to share uh, some of my spiritual journey uh, with all of you and also kind of give you a very brief sermon. It's going to be a little bit 50-50. So, um, but before I do uh, share my personal uh, testimony, I would like to share a story with you. Now, it is out of the Bible, and I may pause at various points to give you an excessive amount of details, because that's what I do. So, without further ado, if you have a Bible with you, uh, please open up to Luke uh, chapter 15, and we're going to be starting at verse 11. If you do not have a Bible, that's okay, because I will be reading it out loud so everyone will be able to hear, uh, hear the story. So, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. Now, Basically, what he's saying there is, Dad, I wish you were dead. I want the insurance money. Seriously, okay? So right away, this is a very shocking story. All right. And the father divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far away country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him out into his fields to feed the pigs. Now, in Hebrew culture, pigs were considered to be very unclean. Um, so this was just about one of the absolute lowest jobs that an Israelite could possibly take in their time and in their culture. Now, as he was, uh, and he was longing to be fed by the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? And here I am, perishing of hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off. Whoop, I lost my place, sorry. Um, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, but am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his older son was out in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants over and he asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry, and he refused 
to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has devoured your property with prostitutes and killed the fattened calf for him, and he said to him, the Father, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have, all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Now, as many of you know, the story that I just uh, read is one of Jesus' probably most well-known parables of all time. I mean, just about everyone has heard of the prodigal son story. And there is so much within this text, and I should know. In college, I, after, I did uh, write a 25-page paper on that little segment right there. And uh, yes, for those who are wondering, I did get an A. Um, <laughs> but uh, joking aside, uh, there's something interesting that I've continued uh, to notice as I've reflected on this passage over the years. And that is uh, various parts of that text stood out to me at various times, and my understanding of what's really happening within this parable has evolved over time. While there are many interpretations that I think are true, each in their own right, there is an angle of the story that I would like to focus on uh, for our time that we have here today. Both the younger brother and the older brother held beliefs surrounding what the father's reaction should be when the younger son came home. And I think the most interesting thing about it is that neither of them were correct. Both sons got their understanding of their father wrong. Now, I want you to hold on to that thought. So lock that into your brain for a little bit, and we're going to come back to it in just a few minutes. But now it's time to share my story with you. So I grew up in a Christian home. My parents are right here. I thought they raised me really great. <laughs> um, and uh, I was introduced to the idea of God and Jesus at a very very early age. Uh, as a matter of fact, I can't even remember a time where I didn't have an understanding of, you know, God's love or Jesus or anything like that. And we did move around a lot, so I got used to kind of being the new kid and didn't always have a ton of friends. I uh, liked to be on my own a lot. Um, I was always very sensitive and empathetic, and I never wanted to disappoint anyone, and especially those who I respected most, which most often in my life were my parents, my family, and occasionally my teachers. Yes, even the teachers got respect. Um, I had a strong desire to do what was right, and I think that was largely influenced by my upbringing, and I think it was also very influenced by my understanding of what uh, having faith in God meant to me at the time. I largely believed that God's love for me was deeply connected and rooted to how closely I followed his commandments. And so I took those commandments very, very seriously. And between my sensitivity towards negativity and critique, my strong moral compass, and my understanding of how God's love worked, I almost never did anything consciously wrong. <laughs> um, I believe that I was most worthy of love when I did good things. And I did not particularly find myself being worthy of love if I wasn't being good. And so there were very, very few days where I didn't do my absolute best to be everything, as, to be as good as I could possibly be. I placed such high pressure on myself to be the best son that I could possibly be, and I wanted to be the best at absolutely everything I did, and believed that my worth was connected to my obedience and to my performance. Eventually, my attitude turned uh, into kind of a false humility, if you will, and it wasn't uncommon for me to believe that I was better than all the other kids who I went to school with or other families and things like that that I knew because I was doing the right thing all the time. I was never getting in trouble. I wasn't stealing. I wasn't lying. I was doing the right thing. And uh, that was just how I acted. That's how I thought. And that continued for a long time. And right before we went into sixth grade, we ended up moving uh, again from Iowa to here in the great state of Minnesota. And uh, despite leaving all my friends behind from Iowa, 
and very quickly learning why Minnesotans joke about the mosquito being the state bird, I, uh, I, was, I was kind of nervously excited to be here in this new state um, and attend my new school. I, w I was homeschooled when we lived in Iowa for a couple of years and I was now going into public school. And uh, for the vast majority of sixth grade, I was definitely known as that awkward homeschooled kid from Iowa. And uh, that didn't lead to me making a ton of friends, but I did make one really close friend named Micah, who's one of my best friends to this day. And uh, I didn't have a ton of other friends. So me and Micah hung out a lot. Like, I mean, it was, it was awesome. We were like, super, super close. And eventually, uh, my family learned that one of my uh, friends that I had when I was much younger, back when we lived in the Chicago area, uh, his name was Patrick, that his family actually was living in Minnesota as well. And so we got to reconnect and, uh, you know, we only got to hang out once every couple of months or so, but he became one of my other closest friends. Um, we liked to play video games together and Pokemon and all that stuff. And uh, so uh, one day I came home from school and I... You know, it was a normal day at school. Everything, everything felt normal. And I remember that my mom uh, said, hey, Austin, you know, me and your dad need to talk to you about something. Uh, but we, you know, we want you to get your homework done and let's eat dinner and stuff like that before we talk. And I immediately started getting really nervous uh, because I immediately, of course, thought that I must have done something wrong, that they thought I did something wrong or maybe I forgot to turn in a homework assignment or something and a teacher called the house and... and you know, I immediately was like, oh, it's probably something that I've done. And it actually wasn't. Um, they took me down to my room, and then uh, that night they proceeded to tell me that uh, my friend Patrick had taken his own life. Um, he had just turned 13, and I was in eighth grade. Uh, don't know if I was 13 or just barely over 14. <laughs> um, and... Uh, it's hard to know what to do in situations like that. It's hard to know how to make sense of it, and uh, especially because we were just so young. Um, and I, I became very angry, I became very confused, I became very frustrated, and uh, you know, all those normal questions that one would maybe assume that you know, a child <laughs> would have in a situation like that, like why would God allow something like this to happen, or uh, even thinking, oh my gosh, did I do something to, you know, make Patrick feel this way, or, or, you know, was I making a wrong choice, or did he, was he doing something that he shouldn't have been doing, and, and it was all very confusing, because you just don't know how to handle that, and that was really the first time that I really experienced death in a, in a way that hit me in the way that death tends to hit people, and uh, despite just not being sure what to think, um, my faith remained pretty strong, but every time that I would think about Patrick, it would trouble me, and I would oftentimes cry thinking about it. And uh, shortly thereafter, high school started. And uh, ninth grade went about normally for the most part, but I started noticing that there was kind of a darkness that was within me that was starting to well up. And by the time my sophomore year had rolled around, it had hit me full blown. And... Uh, I started dating, which ended up being a huge mistake for me at the time. Um, and uh, before long, I, I, I was in such a dark spot that I started uh, self-mutilating and uh, frequently thought about death and uh, just had a hard time with wanting to have the desire even to be alive. And I did a pretty good job of hiding it, but I think my parents and other people started noticing it eventually. And Eventually, I started being a little bit more honest with what I was feeling with people, but I didn't tell them everything. And there was one night in particular that I remember where it was probably 3 a.m., and I was having severe insomnia, and, and it was just having a terrible time trying to figure out how to fall asleep. And there was one, one morning where it was about 3 a.m., and I just, I just couldn't do it anymore. I was just so tired, and, and I was on my knees crying, praying to God, saying, God, I can't, I can't keep doing this. this something's got to change here because I don't know if I can keep, keep this up. I just don't feel anything anymore, and I can't do this. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and, and uh, 
I'll be honest, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> and it was that night that I started questioning the foundations in which I was even raised and uh, started kind of a very lonely journey into somewhere in between agnosticism and atheism. And quite honestly, I'm not even sure where I was for the most part during that time. Eventually, my depression and my anxiety and my uh, just physical safety got to a point where I needed to be checked into a hospital. And I was an inpatient for an entire week um, in a psych ward and uh, constantly being monitored. Um, you know, I had to start taking medications and started attending uh, some therapy and uh, it was really tough, and, and the medication and therapy did definitely help a little bit, but there was still this just gulf of darkness and sadness that I felt within me that just never, never went away. And I started feeling extremely hopeless. And uh, there was one particular day which was extremely difficult, and I didn't have a very great time in therapy. <laughs> and uh, we were, my mom was driving, driving us home, and I remember just feeling like, nothing was going to change ever and, and I was going to feel like this forever and there was no hope at all and I just felt nothing but sadness and anger and frustration and and then sudden, suddenly something happened that absolutely shocked me and quite frankly I don't even know how to totally make sense of it to this very day. And uh, uh, scientists call it a mystical experience um, which not everyone necessarily has, but some people have them every once in a while. And uh, what happened was I basically felt like a wave had crashed into me. If any of you have ever been to the ocean or, uh, you know, and had your back to a wave and the wave just hits you and all of a sudden you're just like, oh my gosh, something's happening. That was how I felt. And all the pain and anger and sadness that I had just literally in a snap of a finger, it was gone. And it was replaced by this joy and this happiness that I quite honestly hadn't felt in probably four months. And it was very surprising, and I, I could have swore that I heard this audible voice saying, I am here with you. And as anyone might, I completely broke down crying because I had no idea what to make of it. But I can tell you this. My understanding of God at that time began to change. And I think that my idea of what love was started to change too. And uh, I wasn't convinced necessarily that <laughs> Jesus was important or anything like that at that point still, but later I went on a retreat that uh, um, one of my friends invited me on. And quite honestly, the, the biggest reason I wanted to go was because my friends were going. Um, but while I was there, I had a uh, beautiful encounter with the Christ um, while uh, singing this song called How He Loves, which we'll listen to uh, in a little bit. And uh, from then on, things weren't necessarily easy, but they definitely started to get better. And I'll be honest, since then, I've had many periods of my heart hardening and believing that I have everything figured out, thinking that I know all the answers to life's biggest questions, having theology nailed down to a T, being able to give you an answer for just about everything. And I've also gone the complete opposite direction where I have felt like everything that I've ever learned or everything I have ever figured out has been completely and utterly undone and I have felt lost. And I can tell you this, it becomes very easy to assume that we are either destined for judgment as the younger son believed or that we are somehow better off because of the things that we do, or sometimes even the things that we don't do. And regardless of whether I felt lost, found, or hardened, I try to always remember the father's response to his sons in the story. The father, seeing his younger son come home, was filled with compassion and ran to him and embraced him. The, the Greek word for this compassion is a gut-wrenching emotion. It's, it's, it's like that most intense feeling that you can get seeing something that is so 
just makes your heart hurt almost. And, uh, and, and that's what happens to the father when he sees his son. And something that I like to point out is that the father was filled with compassion and ran to him before he had any idea why his son was even coming back home in the first place. For all he knew, he was coming back home to ask for more money. He could have been coming home in a plot to kill his brother and father to make even more money. He could have been doing anything other than coming back to say he was sorry. But it didn't matter. He ran to the son. And when the older son becomes angry and refuses to celebrate, the father comes out and speaks to him and he talks with him and he invites him earnestly to come in and celebrate. But the son refuses. And the older son argues with his father about his deservedness of his own celebration and his own rewards. And the father responds with, I think, one of the most compelling verses in Scripture that there is. He says, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. The older son always had the very thing that he was trying to get. I resonate so deeply with both the younger brother and the older brother in this parable that Jesus talks about. And maybe if we look deep enough inside, we may find that all of us resonate with this story on some level. I think we've all experienced the feeling of being lost or being confused or being strong-headed or, being und or feeling undeserving. Or maybe we know what it feels like to be jealous, self-righteous, judgmental, unforgiving, and hardened. The love that the father has for his sons is the kind of love that breaks open our understanding of forgiveness and grace and judgment and allows us to be transformed, even if it's something that we can't fully understand, even if it's something that despite us our whole most being we try to explain, we can't necessarily find the words for. It confronts the rigid understandings that we once held and breaks the barriers of certainty to leave us in a place of awe and wonder. And in those moments, I'm going to be really honest, we have a choice to either accept that newfound grace and love that has been there the entire time or we can double down on our old understandings. Like the brothers in the story, it was easy for me to think that I had things figured out. It was easy to think that I had the right answers. To believe that I knew what I deserved and what others deserved until I was broken open by love and grace. And I hope and I pray that that same love and grace may be found in each in every one of us, that we may be challenged by that love and by that great, great mystery. Because love does the thing that's usually most unexpected.